I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help coming from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He shall not suffer thy foot to be moved. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is a shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thy soul. He shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forevermore. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is Pastor Tyrone S. Hillman, Jr. of Shekinah Christian Fellowship right here in the city of San Francisco. And I'm excited, amen, to do our word and worship with you on this Wednesday. Amen. I'd like to give you an opportunity. We're going to take just a few moments uh, to go ahead and get started and allow folks to go ahead and join in and to participate. Please go ahead and like and share the link. Uh, with all of your friends, your family members, and your co-workers, and let them know we're about to do Bible study, feel free to join us. And for those who may not actually be able to join on Facebook or, uh, or be able to watch on YouTube, you can always tune in uh, by participating on our conference call number. That telephone number is 302-202-1110. 302-202-1110. Access code 892-253. That information should be available for you right there in the comments, all right? We're going to take one minute, and then I'm going to ask you to go ahead and keep inviting as many of your friends and family members and letting them know we're about to have word and worship. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I pray that you all have been having a wonderful day. I know I have. Amen. As we continue to respect what we have been asked to do in terms of this shelter in place order, we're grateful that God has continued to tabernacle and to dwell with his people. But we're reminded that Jesus told us that I would never leave you and that I would never forsake you. Amen. 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 So thank you to our virtual worship experience. Amen. We're gathered into the cyber sanctuary. I'm seeing some of the saints of God already. Amen. Brother DK, bless you, big brother. Jameer, amen, bless you. Amen. For Sister Leslie and the Wagners, amen, God bless you. Lana, my baby, bless you. Sister Carson, love you. Mama Jan, love you. Amen. So glad to see so many of you all, amen, logging in and participating. We're going to get started in just a moment. Bless you, Brother Marshall. Bless you, Sister Tavon. Amen. Don't forget, there's an opportunity to connect as well online, 302-202-1110, access code 892-253. That information is available in the comments. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Life is happening. Amen. You guys are logged in right here at our home. As I said to you all before, I think we have a package that's coming. So praise the Lord. Amen. It sounds like it's here. And I, don't, I think one of my kids is probably going to go ahead and go get it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So with that being said, um, I want to encourage you, don't forget uh, that we do continue to have a series of songs that are available for you uh, to participate. Uh, that's a for worship. Uh, remember, it's important for us to laud, to praise, and to sing songs unto God. There's something powerful and profound about singing. Singing has a way of reordering our thoughts, our perspective, and our understanding after the heart of God. And so we love to, uh, I encourage the people of God to exercise that particular spiritual practice as a way of ordering your thoughts, your heart, and your mind after the things of God. And also, I'd also like to, again, welcome you, each and every one of you all, into our virtual worship experience. Amen. To our other big brother, David, big brother David Royal. I love you, man. Hallelujah. Good to see you, brother. And uh, glad you're able to participate with us uh, on this evening. Amen. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go with a scripture reading, as we do, as a part of our call to worship. Amen. Turn with me to Psalm 148. Psalm 148. Because I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, uh, a little bit of an uh, alteration from what you uh, usually hear me reading from in terms of the King James Version. Um, but uh, just I'll, I'll make certain that I mention the verses alongside. I'd also like to ask you all, amen, if you're able to stand, to stand for the reading of the word of God. Um, that is our custom as a way of we uh, use to reference God's word. And uh, we'll be reading from Psalm 148. And the reading of the word of the Lord is this, 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. Verse 6. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Verse seven, praise the Lord from the earth. Ye sea monsters and all the depth, all the deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind, fulfilling his command. Verse nine, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, 10, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all the peoples, princes and all the, rules of the rulers of the earth. Young men and women alike, old and young together, let them praise the name of the Lord. For his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. He has raised up, last verse, verse 14. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful, for the people of Israel who are close to him. Praise the Lord. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. The same way that God has now has uh, greeted us and welcomed us into this virtual experience, I'd like to simply ask you to go into the comments and greet one another with the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So come on right there. Amen. Go ahead and say, uh, God bless you to your brothers and sisters. If you see someone you haven't seen in a while or someone that you frequently fellowship with, go ahead and greet them. Brother Emmanuel, Brother Emmanuel, God bless you. Grace and peace to you. Amen. Sister Gina, grace and peace to you. Amen. Lady Brittany, peace and prosperity multiply to you. To mom and dad Hillman, we love you. Strength and mercy increase in your life. Amen. To Sister Patricia Miles, grace and mercy increase in your life. Amen. To Prophet Justice, amen. May clarity and divine inspiration expand and enlarge itself in your life. Amen. To Sister Carolyn, peace and mercy increase in your life. To Brother Darnell and Tati, amen. Prosperity and grace increase in your life. Amen. To Sister Charlene and my brother, amen, uh, uh, of the Browns, amen. Strength and mercy increase in your life as well. Amen. Consider this. This might be the kindest word that someone has received all week long. Amen. So share those greetings, that grace, and that peace with your fellow brothers and sisters. If, if we have any visitors, if this is someone's first time participating with us, come on, just make sure you DM us, uh, share messages with us, letting us know this is your first time participating. We want to make sure that we get you and, and we are uh, are connected with you appropriately. Amen. To Brother Antonio, my brother, amen. Prosperity and peace be multiplied to you, man. Amen. Amen. Well, now that we've been welcome, and then don't forget also to Prophetess Leisha, who's hanging on there with our voicemail or our call line. Lee, love you as well. Amen. And to all the saints of God that are joining us on our conference call, God bless you. And thank you. Amen. Now we want to do what saints do, which is pray. Amen. The Bible says, ask and we shall receive, seek and we shall find, knock and the door shall be opened unto us. For the God that we serve, he is a good God. He is our heavenly Father. He is our Abba. Amen. And because we are able to turn to him, he will not give us stone when we ask him for bread or for fish, but we serve a good God. And so we want to call upon his name right now. We want to invoke him. We want to believe and have our confidence and our trust in him boosted and bolstered as we would explore the word of God. So let us pray. Gracious God and Father, we thank you. We thank you that this is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you, God, that because we belong to you, you are perfecting those things which concerneth us. And so, God, because you hung, bled, and died on the hill called Calvary, and you have given unto us your precious Holy Spirit, we thank you that, God, you continue to breathe your Ruach on the inside of us, that we have life-giving power that grants us access to your divine presence. So, God, it is on this night that we would ask that you would move by miracles, signs, and wonders. We ask, God, that you would preserve your people from illness and sickness. We ask, God, that you would enlarge, expand, and advance the faith of your people so that we can trust you to slay giants, to defeat demons and to cast out every satanic structure that is incompatible with your plan, your purpose, and your spirit. So God, let us do that which is pleasing in you. Open thou our eyes that we might see. Open thou our ears that we may hear. Speak to us, inspire us, encourage us that we may live vicariously through the Son of G through your Son Jesus Christ. So Lord, we pronounce victory. We pronounce success. We pronounce your hand upon our life. 
God, give us the ability to reflect, give us the ability to sense and recognize. Grant us, oh God, the ability so that we can discern when you are moving, to discern how to maneuver, to discern, God, how to manage the moments of our life so that we can have clarity, so that we can have insight, so that we can have understanding that denotes that we are in partnership and we are in intimate relationship with you. You are our Father, and you said you'll never leave us and you'll never forsake us. So be with us in this time. In Jesus' name, thank God and amen. Amen. So again, I'm grateful for this time. Amen. I'm sure um, by this time, because uh, many of y'all don't know, uh, but Brother David Roy, I have a long history uh, with this wonderful gentleman, he is my—he is one of my one of my brothers. Uh, known me since I was uh, known me since I was a child, and I'm sure he's probably already put one Mr. Rogers joke in the comments uh, about my tie and my get up. Amen. And he probably even about my afro. Amen. Ah, there it is. Yes. So I love you, David. Man, it's good to see you, brother. <laughs> amen. Amen. So with that being said, we are studying the book of Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, and uh, we are in chapters 36 and chapter 37, chapter 36 and chapter 37. Now, one of the things that we have already noted, and I'm kind of getting my things organized because as you can see here, I have my study Bible, I got my lesson plan here, I got my laptop, also got my ruler because, you know, when I'm writing in my study Bible, I like the underlying passages that leap out into my mind. And I don't like crooked lines all in my Bible. I like to have them straight. So Sister Tavon knows I got my ruler handy, all right? So I got my ruler, got my Bible, got the study lesson that we're going to be looking at on today. So uh, the, the author that uses and the lesson that we're using, again, it doesn't require that you as a participant use the exact lesson as long as you're following along with the scriptures. Now, again, one of the things that we have stated, and I think it bears repeating, is that this is a little bit different uh, than our normal uh, Sunday worship experience. This is Bible study. And the intent of the Bible study is so that we can lift out of the text that we would normally peruse and read as a part of our daily devotion so that we can find additional insight that expands and enlarges how God desires to script our very own lives. It is as we study the scriptures that we're able to reflect uh, and then the Holy Spirit is able to bring back to remembrance all of the things in which we have been taught. And so I believe that as we study the scriptures, not only is it important for us to understand the context in which those passages have unfolded, but as we are able to unfold and understand the context in which those passages have been articulated and, and have been captured within, we then are properly able to interpret and identify meaning for our own lives. Recognize and remember this. Again, we've said this before, that the debate specifically within Christian circles or even within Hebraic circles is not necessarily what the text says. It's really around what the text means. Okay, so I want us to keep that in mind. Where do we locate meaning? How do we identify what a passage means? Is meaning only located within our particular context as a people, or is the only meaning to be found within the context of the original recipients of that particular word? This is all a part of, a, of an interpretive rubric when we are looking at the word of God, all right? So, the title of this lesson is Birth of a New Nation. It's broken up into two segments. Again, as I say, we're looking at chapter 36 and chapter 37. In these two segments, the title uh, that the author gives unto these is the Restor Restoration of Israel's Purity and then the Restoration of Israel's Politics. Restoration of Israel's Purity and then the Restoration of Israel's Politics. And uh, I'd like to offer uh, for you to consider, and I, I, I sometimes like to, to avoid trying to summarize because I think when we summarize, uh, we have a tendency to distill down and we can we can miss some of the most tremendous nuggets that can be influential and impactful, uh, especially as we're trying to identify meaning. But for someone who may not be familiar with chapter 36 and chapter 37, I'll give you a couple of words to consider, uh, a couple of words to consider or a few words to consider, excuse me, restoration, regeneration, resurrection and reunion. Restoration, regeneration, resurrection, and reunion. Reunion, all right? Now, there's a couple questions that I'm planning to maybe answer. So those of you all who may have your books, I may be thinking about answering question number two on page 65 or maybe even question number one on page 67. I'll read those a little bit later um, as we get to them, all right? 
So let's make sure that we get the appropriate context. You guys know Ezekiel, his name means what Yahweh or God has hardened, God has hardened, or God has strengthened. And God had given him a strong personality and a strong word. Why? Because the people that he was delivering the word to were delusional. They were under the illusion that the the type of judgment uh, or the uh, the penalty and the punishment that they were presently up under uh, was one that would end quickly and swiftly. And so what God had to do with the prophet Ezekiel was to raise him up with a hard word that would jar the people of God into a reality so that they would repent of their iniquity. All right. And so when we look at chapter 36, I liked, I love chapter 36 as well as chapter 37 because it begins to unfold for us uh, some extremely important concepts. Now, again, like I said, this is Bible study. So we're going to study the Bible, right? All right. So I hope you got your Bible. You don't have to have, a, have one out if you got your Bible app, you got your laptop out, that's all right. You can pull those things up side by side, try to minimize your screen on Facebook and then put your Bible app on the side there on your screen. That's some, sometimes that's a pretty good way to, uh, to kind of follow along. So let's look at verse one and then I'm going to jump around a couple of times to the book of Genesis. All right, I'm going to run back to the book of Genesis. 36 verse one and it reads, and you mortal prophesy to the mountains of Israel. Interesting. In chapter 36, Ezekiel is informed, instructed to prophesy to the mountains of Israel. He is told to prophesy to the mountains of Israel. I'd like to offer and suggest to you that there is a theme within scripture that God cares about property. God cares about land. Um, God not only cares about people, but he does care about property. And I want to, I want to show you a few biblical texts that supports that particular premise. All right. So turn to book, turn to Genesis chapter two. All right. So in Genesis chapter two, verse And for those who are familiar with this, don't be surprised if someone ever tells you that within the book of Genesis, there are two accounts of creation. Amen. There, don't be surprised by that. In Genesis chapter one, there's one account. And then in Genesis chapter two, uh, there's another account. OK, and so we are reading another account specifically in Genesis and a, and those particular accounts serve different purposes. But we look within the second account, verse five, it says, and again, I'm reading from the New Revised standard version, just particularly for Bible study purposes, all right? When no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, look at the latter part, and there was no one to till the ground. God creates heavens and the earth, and in this account, you see God's concern literally for the ground. You see this notion Sorry about that. We have a have a disturbance here that I need to clarify and get out of here. My apologies, you all. Sorry about that, you guys. We had someone who did some reckless things here. All right. strange. Praise the Lord. All right. Genesis chapter two, verse five. And so it says, and there was no one to till the ground. There was no one to till the ground. Amen. Can we bind every spirit right now Come on. in the name, in of, the Jesus. name of Jesus. We destroy every demonic force that would seek to be a source of discouragement for all of God's people. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rules of darkness of this age, spiritual wickedness in high places. But by the authority that has been bestowed upon us by Jesus Christ, we cast down every demonic system, every form of assault, every form of discouragement that would try to come against the people of God. And so, God, we decree and declare by the power of Jesus Christ that every form of attack would be negated, nullified, and void in the name name of Jesus. For the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but mighty through God, yes. pulling down the strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of 
of God and bringing every thought into captivity. And so, God, we bring every demon into captivity and subject to the authority of Jesus Christ. Every form of demonic influence is under our feet. We decree and declare in Jesus' name that by the power of God, we belong to you. And God, because we belong to you, there is nothing the enemy can do to persuade us to function in evil and discourage us to keep us from your righteousness. So, God, we thank you for preserving us and going before us. In Jesus' name, thank God. And amen, 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 amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. And so, as we find ourselves, uh, again, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 5, I also want you to turn over, jump really quickly to Genesis uh, chapter 12. Amen. And my sincere apologies to those that were on the conference call. Amen. Uh, for that foolishness. Amen. Genesis chapter 12. Uh, Genesis chapter 12. Now we see the word of the Lord to Abraham. And God says unto Abram, excuse me, to Abram. Amen. He says unto Abram. And, uh, and unto Abram, he says, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Then look down at verse seven. Verse seven then says, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. The very purpose of me reading those verses in context or in continuity with Ezekiel chapter 36, verse one, where Ezekiel was told to do what? To prophesy to the mountains, right? Prophesy, prophesy to the mountains. And then when we look at Genesis chapter two, we see when God created the earth, he said he recognized that there was no one there to tend the garden, right? Or to tend the ground. And then we see in Genesis chapter 12, verse one, uh, through six, we see the reversing of the curse. So if you look all throughout the book of Genesis, if one were to count the number of curses or the word curse that was used, you see now when Abraham, when God begins to call Abram out of his father's country and out of his father's, out of his native land, we then now see God articulating the blessing. He says, I will bless you. I will bless those. I will bless you. I will bless, bless you. And I will bless you and make a blessing. So he's literally reversing the curse associated with man's sinfulness. He is unfolding the narrative, the redemptive narrative within, uh, within scripture. But what's interesting though, when you look at Genesis chapter 12, verse seven, is that you see a connection not only between people, but also with property. You see God saying unto Abraham, not only do I want to give you an offspring, but I want to give your offspring a place, a habitation. And so uniquely, I like to suggest to you that one of the things specifically associated with capitalism is capitalism is constantly looking for profit. And one of the ways to maximize profit is that you have to separate people from place. But God has an eerie, strange, and unique way of constantly looking to put, to put people in places or to connect people with places and with property. Hallelujah. Isn't that good news? Hallelujah. Amen. And so even then when you look at Genesis chapter uh, Genesis chapter 15, when God speaks that same word of promise to Abraham, tells him um, because he, he denied uh, the kings of, of, of Sholodomar, uh, specifically who tried to, en to enrich him, basically saying that God then tells him, hey, that in blessing, I will bless you and multiply and multiply your seed as the sand was upon the seashore and uh, your seed shall possess the gates of the enemies. Beautiful words of articulation, but even in that, God tells Abraham, I will be your exceeding and your great reward. And, uh, but Abraham continues to say, you have not given me an offspring. You've given me prosperity. You've given me property, but I don't have people. So God has a way of integra integrating prosperity, people, and, and, and property. Okay, so I want you to see that, that relationship uh, between land or between property, as I'm using that particular word, and people. So look at Ezekiel chapter 36. So now let's jump back to Ezekiel chapter 36. All right. In Ezekiel chapter 36. And again, what you see is um, you, you'll constantly see this revelatory uh, word of instruction that is given unto Ezekiel, where the hand of the Lord would be upon Ezekiel or God would give him to prophesy. In this particular text, Ezekiel is prophesying to the land. Isn't that interesting? Ezekiel isn't just prophesying to the people. 
he's prophesying to the property, the people. He's not prophesying just to the people, he's prophesying to the land. And it's interesting, even one of the, one of the scriptures I think many of us are quoting during this time, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and do what? Turn from their wicked ways and seek my face. Uh, then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sins and do what? Heal the land. And I think many times as we thought about God forgiving our sins, we may not continue or immerse ourselves into the reality of what it means for God uh, to heal the land, to heal the land. And so there's a couple of things that you will see within, Ephi uh, with almost said Ephesians, Ezekiel chapter 36. And so what God then begins to say in verses, uh, let's see, I think right there, verses one through 12, we see God making a commitment to repopulating the land, to rebuilding the cities. And in essence, articulating that things will be better than what they were before. Now, why is this important? Ezekiel was prophesying to a people who have just seen the temple destroyed. He's prophesying to an exiled people who have observed the greatest of them, the best of them, the, the leaders, the governors, the, the most prolific persons within their society. These persons have all been subjugated and the confidence that they once had placed in the temple, the temple now has been ransacked and destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. So now Ezekiel is prophesying to a people that is without property, and now they are literally homeless. This is one of the three times in which you will find uh, Israel homeless. Uh, you will find them homeless. You will find them disconnected from land. Uh, the other time that you find them disconnected from land, do you, any, any takers on that? Anybody know? It's three other times, three other times. So this is one of the times. The other time is when they wandered in the wilderness. So prior to them occupying the, pro the promised land. And then the other time before that is when the forefathers, the, the, Patric the fathers, uh, the Abraham, the Isaacs, and the Jacobs, when they wandered uh, in the promised land, not having technically a home. So it was a time of, of, of essential homelessness. But I want you to understand that there is this, this, this constant... Uh, a strain, this constant tension between, again, people and property. What's interesting enough, again, is that Ezekiel is prophesying to the property. He's prophesying to the property. So one scripture that I'd like you to look at as I jump down, so as I said before, look at verse 11, and I will multiply human beings and animals upon you. Who is you? Well, you is the land. So God is talking to the land. Then it says, they shall increase and be fruitful. And I will cause you to be inhabited as in your former times and will know and will do more good to you than ever before. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a unique phenomenon that as one looks within the scriptures, um, that, the, that one of our favorite scriptures, for God so loved the world, for God so loved the cosmos, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. When we look at the word cosmos, that's all of creation, which includes people. So yes, God loves people, but God also loves the good creation in which he has created. Amen. And so there is a, a responsibility that good people have in order to ensure that the created order remains in alignment with God's plan, will, and purpose. Romans even says it this way, that creation moans and groans for its redemption, uh, moans and groans, looking not to be exploited, but to be used in the way uh, that which God has intended. So look at verse, here's what I'd like you to take a look at. Look at verse 13. Now, verse 13, for those, again, this is not something you would see automatically if you're doing a part of your daily devotion or your reading, but I want you to write just maybe to underline uh, this particular verse down. And it says, thus says the Lord God, because they say to you, you devour people and you bereave your nation of children. Therefore, you shall no longer devour people and no longer bereave your nation of children. Okay. Now, why is that a particular verse of, of importance? Turn to Numbers chapter 13. And as I said before, this is Bible study, right? We got to study the Bible. Yes. Okay. All right, so Numbers chapter 13, verse 32. Now, in this particular verse, this is a, a very familiar verse. You guys remember it was when they sent out the spies to spy out the land. 
Uh, 10 came back with a poor report. 2 came back with a good report. You guys know the story. A story about Joshua and particularly Caleb. Now in verse 32, they bring back a report specifically. And here's what um, these negative words that were used to steer the, an entire nation. It says, then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. So they brought to Israelites an unfavorable report of the land they had spied out, saying, look what this says, the land that we have gone through as spies is a land that will do what? Devour its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are of a great size. So literally, the reputation of the land is to do what? To devour its inhabitants. It's Hallelujah. So it's like when persons will say, man, you can't handle this big city living. They're going to devour. They're going to eat you up. You've heard those, those kinds of terms. Well, here's the word of the Lord from Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 13. Look what he says. You devour people and you bereave your nation of children. Therefore, you shall no longer devour people and no longer bereave your nation of children, says the Lord God. Look at that. God literally is going to reverse the reputation of a land that is known for devouring its people. Instead of the land becoming known for its ability to devour the weak, the marginalized, and the oppressed, it then becomes an incubator for development, a land, a piece of property. Uh, this yet, even in this, this yet-to-be United States of America, this land can be a place that nourishes those that are marginalized, oppressed, depressed, oppressed, all of those different things, but it requires a people that are willing to repent, turn to God, and see God to heal the land. Praise the Lord. Let's keep going. Verse 17. Now look at verse 17. Now verse 17 gets a little bit differently, gets, a, gets into some, some images that might provoke certain, certain particular responses. We want to be sensitive to that. So verse 17 says, more when the house of Israel lived on their soil, their own soil, again, land, talking about land, they defiled it with their ways and their deeds. Their conduct in my sight was like the uncleanness of a woman in her menstrual period. So I poured out my wrath upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for the idols with which they had defiled it. All right. So now it's under, it's one it's unique um, that Ezekiel uses the nida the nida nida n i d d a h nida specifically speaks to uh, the impurity associated with a woman's menstrual cycle. During that particular time, a woman would be considered to be impure and in isolation in order to avoid contaminating others with her impurity, okay? So it's important to understand that in that particular sense, um, that when a woman was in that particular menstrual cycle, she had the ability uh, to infect others by touch. Why is this important? Because God literally is using that image to denote that the people of God have become so impure that everything they touch does not turn to gold, but it turns to dust. Because of the way in which they have managed the land, the, man, the land has now devoured. The land, instead of providing nourishment and strength, has now become consumed and contaminated with wickedness. Now, another thing that we kind of want to remember is that this defilement, and that's the thing about sin. Sin has a way... It's, it has a way of, 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 of engaging in aerial assault. What do I mean by aerial assault? Uh, many times when we think of sin, we think of it simply as being localized uh, to our own individual person. But in reality, what sin has the ability to do is to travel. Sin has the ability to travel and infect other places. It has the ability to move and infect. This is why you can have persons uh, who have been known from known for significant wi uh, wickedness throughout our world, and yet their name it still pro provides and proliferates uh, pain. Uh, so, for example, when I say Adolf Hitler, uh, that name itself it carries with it wickedness, even though that particular person has died is, and is now received is, is going on into judgment, so on and so forth. But the point simply being is that sin has the has the ability to traverse and travel beyond its own locale. This is why 
One of the things that the Old Testament priests would have to do is that they would have to cleanse the tabernacle. They would have to cleanse the holy place with the hatat, with the sin offering. And with that sin offering, what they would do is that they would cleanse the holy place. Now, what's unique is that when a person committed sin, they didn't have to commit it within the tabernacle or within the temple. And yet God required that they would offer offerings that would purge and purify places that they physically could not touch. Why? Because it was an important point. The important point that God is teaching is that sin has the ability to touch places and people beyond our self. Okay? Very, very important. And so it is with the nada, with this sense of impurity, God is suggesting and God is clearly articulating Hey, because you have you are you are contaminating both other people as well as my property, and he is vomiting them. He has vomited them out of the land. He's vomited them out of the property. Now, here's what I like you to also see in verse 22 uh, through 23. Love these verses. Thus says the Lord God: It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you, which you came. I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. And the nation shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when through you I display my holiness before their eyes. Isn't that a powerful and profound verse? God is literally saying, that the reason why you'll be able to return from your exile is not because of your own merit, not because of your own righteousness, but it will be because of, of God's, of Yahweh's concern for his holy name, God's concern for his reputation. Now, I want to offer to you and suggest to you that there's a difference between contract and covenant. The difference between contract and covenant. When we think of contract, it has very explicit terms. You do this, I'll do that. You do this, I'll do that. But there's something unique about covenant. Covenant has the flexibility of mercy and grace and training within it. So that simply means that even if you do this or don't do that, uh, there's a certain level of commitment, a conscientious commitment that I have made, uh, that I have made, or the person has made to that commitment or to that covenant that goes beyond, bless you, darling, hallelujah, that goes beyond in the name of Jesus, let it out, baby, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, that goes beyond your experience. Why is this important? Because when we think of the marriage covenant, Understand that in the scriptures, we are to look at it as a marriage covenant, not simply as a marriage co a contract. When we think of a covenant, when you think of covenant, again, covenant has the flexibility, again, to reimagine and re-envision a future possibility, even if that person has not met all of their obligations. Think about that just for a minute. God has a way with covenant for re-envisioning and reimagining how to commit oneself to that particular covenant, even when someone has not met all of its obligations. I think that's important because especially in our time in which there's this notion of being covenant breakers, uh, it's one of the signs of the last days. People are covenant breakers. They are uh, uh, lovers of, of lovers of themselves. And uh, especially when we think about marriage, a person will say, uh, when we think about marriage, marriage is a covenant. And there are times in marriage when persons may not always fulfill the, uh, the, and uphold their end of the bargain. But even when we understand that, that divorce itself was given for hardness of the heart, according to the scriptures, amen, as well as for, uh, for uh, sexual immorality. But when we think about uh, a covenant, covenant, again, has the flexibility of grace and mercy. So if we would be willing to allow the spirit of God to touch our heart simply in the same way that, that, uh, that Yahweh did with Israel. We see the tenderness to, to find flexibility of grace and mercy in that particular space. Now, granted, I understand everybody's not there and can't do that, but that's a whole nother discussion for another time, okay? But the point that I'd like you to really see is that God has a conscientious commitment to ensuring that he is glorified in the earth. Um, the Bible says it this way, all have sinned and done what? Come on, Romans. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of of God. What sin does is that sin attempts to diminish the glory of God. It is one of the um, it is one of the most it is one of the most ultimate acts of disrespect and irreverence towards a holy God. Sin because it tries it seeks to dis diminish uh, and detract from the glory of God.
But what we see is God is so committed to that glory and to ensuring that you and I are those um, that are participants so that we can experience the pleasure of abiding in the glory of Christ. The other thing that I'd like to, uh, for us to take a look at in this particular chapter, again, and I know we love chapter 37, one of my favorite ones, so I'm going to get there really quickly. But I love chapter 36 because it's usually one that we don't spend a lot of time on. And that's why I'm going to spend some time uh, in particular on it. Now, in chapter 36, you also see, and God says, and a new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove from your body the heart of stone and will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and make you follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. Verse 28. Or excuse me, verse 29. I will look at the I wills. I love the I wills of this statement. I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will summon the grain and make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. I will make the fruit of the tree and the produce of the field abundant so that you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations. Again, you see the connection between prosperity, property, and people. Connection of prosperity, property, and people. All right. Just wanted to, it, it's a, it's a, I think it's a, it's a, a, an important point to consider. The other thing to take into consideration when we see this particular text is that the way in which God wanted to purify the land was through temples, through the temple. Now, when the people of God began to assault the temple with their immorality and with their idolatry, the way in which they polluted the land, a polluted people will pollute the temple and ultimately end up polluting the land. They offer polluted worship. Polluted people offer polluted worship. And so what God has to do has to remind us that if we are to purify the land, we as a people have to be purified so that we can offer up pure worship in the presence of God. So as we see here, thus said the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the towns to be inhabited and the waste places shall be rebuilt. I love verse 35 in chapter 36. He said, this land was desolate, has become like the Garden of Eden. You see the ultimate form of restoration. You see God going about the business of recreation. And recreation is not simply about all of us going to heaven. It's when heaven lives on earth. That's what recreation. Recreation is when um, the channel, the, the infinite access of earth is available, of heaven is available to earth. It is the, the ultimate place where, where interchange, communication, the exchange of information and ideas is able to flow unfiltered uh, and uninhibited, uninhibited and unhindered uh, between heaven and earth. That is what chapter 36 is really getting at. And then you see right there the culmination of it all at the end you see the ultimate end of this word of prophecy is what then they shall know that i am the lord all right don't forget give you a chance to maybe say one of the questions that you'd like to do shoot that over to us either in a direct message or in the comments all right so the last thing that i wanted to say specifically about this particular chapter is that yahweh is replacing god is replacing the hearts of stone with hearts of flesh He's literally giving the people of God a heart transplant. Now, here's the thing. There's a tenderness. There's a tenderness and a toughness. There's a togetherness that comes when God gives us a heart of flesh rather than one for a, a heart of stone. And this kind of heart, please hear me. The heart that God gives us is not just one that allows us to go to heaven. The heart that he gives us is one that is transformed so that we can serve God in the land. So we can serve God in the property that he has given unto us. Hallelujah. If we are to be a people, we are to also be a people that occupies property. Property. The Bible even says it this way. Jesus said this before. He says, look, you got to occupy till I return. Hallelujah. So we got to occupy uh, until we return. We have to live in this world. We have to live. And that's the inheritance uh, that we leave for our children's children, the way in which we manage the property that God has given unto us and how we transition it and how we transfer it to the next generation. It is something that we want to do skillfully. We have to, we have to do it lovingly. We have to do it knowingly. We can't do it with greed. We can't do it clumsily. We can't do it destructively. We can't do it with desecration in our minds and with this perspective that there's no future uh, for others. We have to do so with the knowledge and with the perspective that we're going to transition and hand it off to someone else. Okay. So again, Abraham was told, go into a land that I will show you. There's this connection again between people and property. All right. Now jump to Ezekiel chapter 37. Y'all know this one. Can these bones? I hear prophet already. 
Can these bones live again? Lord, you know. This is a valley of dry bones. Dry bones. What's unique? Specifically, when you think of bones, uh, I want you to also take into consideration that in the, in the Eastern culture, in the Eastern civilization, um, that to see bones or uh, bones that were not buried, that was the ultimate form of desecration. That simply means that when a person died, they were not given the legitimacy of a proper burial. So when Ezekiel sees a valley of dry bones, what he is observing is a group of people that have been slaughtered and slain and their bodies have been left to rot in an open field. And because their bodies have been left to rot, um, and they, they're literally dry bones. These are not just simply dead bodies. Literally, they have been um, they have been picked. All of the meat has been removed from them, so that all that the remnant of what used to be a nation, what used to be a people, has literally been left. It's it's literally dead. This is dead. This is the ultimate sign of death, uh, deadness, and decay. And um, and what Ezekiel was then instructed to do, y'all know the word. He is told to do what? Prophesy. And one thing that we have to take into consideration uh, specifically for us as a prophetic people, according to Acts chapter 2 and then Joel chapter 2, where the Bible says that God says, I'll pour out my spirit upon what? Upon all flesh, my sons and my daughters, they shall do what? They shall prophesy. So we as a prophetic people, we are a prophesying people that are declaring the word of God. We're not only foretelling, but we are foretelling. We are declaring a future that is to come, a future where the Messiah will come. He will reign. He will rule upon the affairs and in the kingdom of men. And so when we think about the words, the words that we offer, they are not simply the transmission of information. We have to ask ourselves, what end will our words achieve? Let me say it again. We have to ask ourselves when we're saying stuff, this will help us to eliminate gossip. Come on, you know, some of the saints, some of the saints, we struggle with gossip. Yes, you do. Hallelujah. Don't look at nobody else. Look at yourself. I'm talking to you. Yes, I am. We struggle with gossip. We call it prayer requests. We call it concerns. Ultimately, it boils down to gossip. It's things that we're bringing up uh, that's a form of complaint where we have, because uh, we don't have confidence in laying our request and our petition before God, and because we want to move somebody else and get a response out, we go sip, okay? We gossip, okay? Now, that's that's a whole other, now I want y'all to know, gossip is not just for women. Go sip is associated from the first century, one, and specifically Roman culture, when men would go and sip beer or sip narcotic, and then they would talk amongst themselves about what was going on in the empire. So gossip is not just a feminine quality. It also infects masculine brothers as well. So come on, man. We got to, we got to stop all this go sipping, uh, all this gossiping. So the question we want to ask ourselves with the words that we are sharing and articulating is what is being done when that is said? So when I say something, ask yourself, what is going to be done when I say this? One of the things that we are aiming to do with our children is uh, is the discipline of, of considering their ways, considering their actions before they do it so that they're not crying after they've done it and gotten caught. But I say, hey, use those same tears when you're thinking about doing uh, what you're presently doing. Boy, that's a good word for somebody on today. I know you love to. We, we there's Some of us, we have some of our best tears on the altar after we fornicated, after we didn't smoke the weed, after we didn't drink the Hennessy, after we did all the things and then we cry. Well, the thought that introduced the action, cry when you get the thought. Oh, no. You, you should just cry like you would cry after. It. It's the same thing. All right. Those tears are good then too. All right. So, then when you look at Isaiah chapter 55 and 11, I want you to see the importance specifically of our word. Scripture says, so shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish what I please and prosper for the things which I have sent it. The point simply is this, is that God gives his spirit the power to achieve something through our declaration. And it is imperative, it is important, and it is, um, it, is, it, is, it is of the utmost importance of us to make sure that our words are being mediated through the medium of God's Holy Spirit, all right? Last couple of thoughts. Again, um, these are very dry bones. Now, here's a, I want to tell you guys, this is, I think of this as a dry bone moment. And I want to encourage any of our, our pastors and leaders who might be participating 
uh, in this particular session um, that, man, it is challenging to prophesy and to preach God's word into a little small camera. You don't know who's receiving this. You don't know who's listening. You don't know if somebody didn't push pause and went and got them uh, some old potato chips, some old lays. You don't know if somebody's texting, looking at their phone. You don't know if, if anybody's paying you any mind or paying you any attention. And so I find myself uh, similar to Ezekiel prophesying to what appears to be dry bones. I can't see you. I can't see you respond. I can't see you react. It appears as if even sometimes the words that we might be articulating, are, uh, as, as my mama would say, are going on deaf ears. Is there any parents in the house? Seems like what you've been telling your child is it's been going on deaf ears. Well, you got to remember the story of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel, he is prophesied as God has commanded. Important. He is not simply telling his own opinion, but he is proclaiming God's truth. There's a difference. The proclamation of truth is significantly different than sharing your opinion. When one shares their opinion, one's opinion, and, and I think sometimes, especially for, for many of us saints, we confuse our opinion with God's truth. We have a, the we sometimes believe that just because we don't like it, that God don't like it. Uh, beware that we don't want to be those. And I'm getting to my message a little bit on Sunday. Beware that we don't attribute the work of God to demons and devils. Be mindful of that. We don't want to castigate what God might be doing simply because it is far away from our consciousness or how we might do things and assume that it's simply demonically induced. And so I think it's important for us that as we would consider what our opinions are versus God's prophetic truth. Prophetic truth is something that has been laid in the toes of Jesus. Y'all like, like to say feet. I don't want to say toes. I want to give you a different image. We want to lay it in his toes. It's in the, the toes. Put it in his toes. Put that truth that you want to lay into somebody. You know that thing you've been well, you've been waiting to tell them all. That thing has been sitting on you. Finally, you got an opportunity. Now, again, you're not castigating. Because here's the thing what will happen when you lay things at the feet of Jesus. When you lay things at the feet of Jesus, you will not generalize a particular person's behavior, but you will speak to a particular incident. There's one thing to call a person a liar. It's another thing to say you were dishonest about this. Two different things. One is judgmental and determining that your behavior is one that has been always towards lying. So you've never told the truth versus when a person had a dishonest moment. Those are two different things. And when one lays our opinions at the feet of Jesus and in his toes and the toes of Jesus starts to mingle together with our opinion and God starts extracting and removing out. And he says, okay, that's you. Here's me. This is what you're supposed to say or even better. Here's what you ain't supposed to say. <laughs> Hallelujah. Isn't it strange? And many of us, we are clear about what we're supposed to say, but we are not as clear about what we're not supposed to say. Before you bring that word, why don't you even ask God, God, I got clearance on what I'm supposed to say. What am I not supposed to say? Woo! That's a blessing right there. That's a blessing. That just did your test for spirit. See, that's what happened. You put it in his toes. Put it in. Somebody say, put it in his toes. Put it in his toes. Put it in the comments. All right. Then verse 14, it says, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you on, again, there's that, look, that language again, on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. Oh, I got to get this last image. I gotta, I'm going to do this real fast. I, okay, I'm going to cut one of the questions. Okay. <laughs> last image. Verse in chapter 37, you see these two branches, and the prophet is told to get those two branches. One represents the northern kingdom. The other one represents the southern kingdom. And look what God does. God says, bring them back together, knit them together, and he holds them. And then he says this, never again shall they be two nations, and never again shall they be divided into two kingdoms. Isn't it strange that during this time um, that the nation had been divided, there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, can't go all the way into it, but God, after the judgment, is saying, I'm going to unite them together. Literally, what you're seeing is that their unity is something that God does. Our unity as the body of Christ, and my, dare I say, even as a global community, as all of humanity, it has to be done in the hand of God. It has to be done in the nail-pierced hands of Jesus Christ. The person of Jesus is what brings ultimate unity even between that which is presently disconnected. That's why Jesus even prayed that we would be one even as he is one with our Father which is in heaven. Now, that does not mean that we do not 
that we function in what I would call a passive spirit of not actively engaging in the ministry of reconciliation. No, we have a heart to see unity. We don't, we don't find any glory. We don't find any pleasure in observing people going to hell and pronouncing doom and gloom and judgment. No, our desire is that all men would come to repentance because that's the heart of God. And so when we have that kind of heart, we like Christ are, are looking for ways that unite and not divide that bring about harmony even amongst our differences and our distinctions. And here again, we see God saying, I will set them in a sanctuary forever and they, I will be their God and they shall be my people. Glory to God. Man, that blesses me when I think about that. All right, so I'm gonna answer one of the questions. What happened to my book? Oh, there it is. Did anyone mention one of the questions? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do um, 65. Question number two, and then I'm going to get you guys out of here with a benediction. It says, what are some of the ways we can be stumbling blocks to unbelievers? What do you think, Sister Felicia? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. She, I, she probably sat up right at that desk. <laughs> I love you, girl. What are some of the ways we can be stumbling blocks to unbelievers? I'd like to suggest to you one of the ways we can be a stumbling block to unbelievers is with our lack of unity. Um, a lack of being simply on one accord. Our inability to genuinely forgive one another and to aim for reconciliation. Um, if a person uh, comes in, you know, it's strange that I think one of the most dysfunctional forms of being a, dis a stumbling block to an unbeliever is when there's discord amongst the brethren, when there's disunity amongst the body of Christ. We have been uh, sanctified and sanctioned um, by the God who hung, bled, and died. And the Bible says that none of his bones were broken. None of his bones were broken. Why? Because it was to signify that we were never to be disjointed from one another, that we might suffer, we might bleed, and we might even die. But guess what? We ought to do it together. We ought not do it in isolation. We not, ought not do it as individuals. We ought not do it simply pursuing our own dreams, our own goals. So I think one of the ways in which we as believers can be a uh, stumbling block to unbelievers is with our lack of unity. And so, and then obviously I can answer it in a more general sense of saying, well, well we don't honor God. Uh, but I want to be very specific. Specifically, when we don't honor God in the way in which we pursue unity uh, and community amongst the body of Christ. So again, i like to end really quickly with a last thought. Don't forget there, I do believe that there is a connection uh, between property, people, and prosperity. We see that again, even as God is pouring his spirit within us, as he pours out his spirit upon all flesh, God desires for us to be living temples so that we are living stewards of the earth, bringing about heaven's agenda into earth's objectives. So we have a big responsibility. Now there's a tension within certain communities. There are some uh, who say, hey, heaven is my home and I get it. And there's certain scriptures specifically in the book of Hebrews. But I think we should balance that with the reality that the kingdom of God uh, is to come down into the affairs of men. So I challenge you uh, to grow in that particular reality. Thank you so much for joining us for Bible study. Now there's a couple things we wanna do. I wanna, I want to pronounce uh, a word of prayer with you all before we go. I have a couple of announcements. And, uh, and then we'll do our pronouncement of blessing, okay? So let us pray. God, we thank you. We thank you, God, for the words of Ezekiel uh, from the book of, of chapter 36 as well as chapter 37. We thank you for the language of resurrection. We thank you, God, for the words of redemption and hope. We thank you that, God, you are the one that brings about the reunification even of your body. When we find ourselves uh, in our respective places. We're yet gathering virtually on one accord. And so God, we pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would continue to give us a heart of flesh for that which is of stone. Let us not be rebellious. Let us not be obstinate. Let us not be hard-hearted before you. But Lord, let us be sensitive. Let us be uh, genuine. Let us be uh, just, just open to all that you are doing in this time. So God, we pray, God, for every person that is prophesying uh, to seemingly dead situations. 
Lord, inspire them and encourage them to remember the story of Ezekiel when he prophesied to the valley of dead bones. And so God, when he prophesied, they came together, the sinew and, and the bones, they all came together. And then the spirit of God came and they became a vast and strong army. So God, I thank you that even as we might see death, you yet see life. And because you see life, you see purpose. So God, grant us the grace to speak life even as we would affirm the present conditions of what we are faced with. We believe you to do this in Jesus' name. Thank God and amen, amen. Well, before we dismiss, I wanna say again, thank you so much, amen, for joining us on this evening, amen. What a tremendous blessing for us to continue uh, to, uh, to study the book of Ezekiel. I'd like to encourage you, don't forget, those of you all who have joined us, Amen. For our uh, sewing with Shekinah, they'll have that next session, that Thursday session. Y'all know y'all got some homework, Tavon. Y'all got to finish them master. Mom, Lady Margaret is, is going in on y'all. Amen. And so we want to make sure you guys, and if this is your first time you want to participate, you can still sign up. I know Lady Margaret would welcome you as well as the entire team would welcome you uh, with open arms. That's on tomorrow. And then on this Friday, we do have corporate prayer. Y'all heard that foolishness trying to jump on our line. We got to pray, saints. It's time to pray. We got to consecrate ourselves and trust God to come against every one of these demonic forces that's trying to disrupt. Amen. What God wants to divine do in the hearts and minds of his people. So I want to encourage you to join in uh, with our corporate prayer experience. And then also, don't forget, we also have a Q&A session with myself. It's an opportunity to answer questions and to provide the congregation directly with feedback and updates as to where we are with this shelter in place as we continue our loving response Amen to this present pandemic. Amen. So we're prayerful about that. I want to continue to encourage you to join. Amen. And uh, and then last but certainly not least, I'd like to ask you to go to our website, www.scfsf.org. On there, there's a link where you can give, a PayPal link, a secure link for you to give your tithes, your gifts, and your love offerings. What I'd like to say to you, thank you in advance. May God multiply to you some 30, some 60 and some 100 fold. And then finally, I love you with the love of Christ. I'm praying for you. I know you're praying for me and I'm believing God to continue to preserve you, keep you and prosper you during this time. So it is in this moment that what I'd like to do is take this time, amen, to, uh, to pronounce a blessing over each and every one of you. And remember this pronouncement of blessing is not simply the ending of our time together, but it's the recognition that God is apostolically thrusting us and sending us out to be the hands and the feet of Christ. Amen. So it is at this time we simply pronounce these words from the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 3. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. According to the power that works in us. Unto him be glory in the church throughout all ages. World without end. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Thank you so much. God bless you, Daisha. Amen. Candy Way. Hey, girl. God bless you. I love you. Amen. Sister Regina. God bless you, Brother Chalu. I love you, man. Hallelujah. Javier, thank you so much for joining us, sir. God bless you. Sister Afia, bless you. Good to, good to see you. I love you. I love you. Amen. God bless you, Brother Dennis Brown. And Pastor Gillette, man of God, God bless you, sir. Hallelujah. Sister Gina, Brother Emmanuel, God bless you. God bless you. Amen. My big brother David, I love you, man. <laughs> you better call me after this. I love you, dude. Uh, Auntie Viola, I love you. I love you. Y'all wave at me. Say, I love you. Put me, put, send me a note so I can see it later. All in the comments. Sister Olivia, hey, y'all, Amara said hi to me the other day. I was so blessed. I said, see, I know the Lord is moving when the baby speak to me. And God bless you, sister. To Stephanie, amen, you and their grandbaby, God bless you, amen, brother Justice, prophet Justice, love you, amen, DK, thanks for joining, man, God bless you, sister Crystal, amen, and Renata, bless you all, I love you with the love of Christ, thank you, and I'll see you guys next time.